Hey, Lazarus Symposium number 22. And um, this segment, which I've been looking forward to pretty much all week, is prehistoric cave art, the psychopathogenesis of humankind with um, Jane Evershit. Jane, happy to see you. Nice to be here, Sasha. So I'm thrilled to welcome you back. And um, you, of course, are our resident artist and researcher back to the Lazarus Initiative Symposium, and you're also a fellow of the um, of the New Earth University. Today, we're exploring prehistoric cave art, and although it isn't generally considered a controversial topic, we might all revise our perspectives after hearing what you have to say, because for generations, uh, prehistoric cave art has fascinated um, us, obviously, because it's the oldest trace element memory record that we have of ourselves. Um, so it's a compulsion uh, to look at these totems and petroglyphs and hieroglyphs and, and, and Stone Age art if we're, to, if we're to find our way through a glass darkly to our cosmogenesis. But few have stopped to ever consider its true purpose. And your extensive research it reveals that it uh, served a critical role Stone Age art in the psychopathogenesis of humankind itself, far beyond mere expression. Its intended goal was to eliminate the so-called Christ consciousness from the world. And Today to we prevent the ascension oh. of humanity. Well, the whole idea was to belittle us so that we would feel that we had come so far from being evolved, uh, uh, from evolving since prehistoric times that right now we were at the zenith of our evolution and that and, and it, we were as far from ascension as we were from being prehistoric beings. Right. Okay, very good. Would you say this is as significant um, as the last um, revelation that we did, which was regarding um, the Renaissance and the role of the Renaissance in history? It, it absolutely is, Sasha. You know, when you think of prehistoric art, you just think of a little cave, some paintings or drawings on it, and that's the end of it. But when you go deeper, you find out that it's absolutely connected to everything and where we are today. And that's why I'm doing it, because we have to look back. We have to know how we got into this mess. Yeah. And it's very much to do with this psychology behind all of this work so what is it that's compelling you um what's the inertia that's driving you in this in this inquiry i mean first with the renaissance which seems to be a seminal piece and now with the uh, with cave art because art and visual art is so underrated as to the as to its power along with symbology and we don't, when you ask someone, you know, if they're an artist or they like art, art, they just get this blank stare across their face, but it's really one of the most powerful things on earth. And it has shaped us psychologically throughout the ages. And most people just say, I can't even draw a stick figure and they move on and they don't realize this is connected to our creation currency, and they've been using our creation currency to develop the world they wanted. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's time for us to take that back and create the world we want for humanity. I love that. So it, it really is a reclamation, and it really does stand in in, in alignment with um, with regenesis, with um, with restoration of absolute sovereignty and standing under the eternal gaze of the sun. I love it. Um, okay, crack on. Well, you've got um, a presentation which you very graciously prepared again. I'm hoping that this finds its way into the curriculum um, that you're developing within the New Earth University. I'm assuming it does. Well, I think once that I've gone through modern art with a fine tooth comb, I will have prehistoric art, Renaissance, and then modern art, and then I'll have a complete curriculum. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, darling. Well, why don't you just take it away? Um, we're going to be relegated to the side and you'll drop us back in occasionally to dialogue on a couple of points. But in the main, we're going to be walked through a presentation which you've, you've prepared. OK, and you'll be so surprised because everyone thinks, you know, who cares about cave art? Well, you'll find out why. Right. <laughs> This connection to the caves is absolutely enormous and I wouldn't be able to do it justice without connecting all the dots. And as you'll see, we've gone from all the way from apehood to augmentation. At both ends of the spectrum, we've only got half a brain. And I've got a new word now, 
it's transhumanic because that's what it is. We're moving towards this transhumanist era, which is absolutely maniacal. So we need to know what's going on in order to go back and find out where we went wrong and we'll never repeat it again. So we'll start back where we were in the Renaissance in Naples, Italy, with uh, the Jesuit Prince de Sangro. And he was initiated into the so-called sacred arts, which has been handed down obviously through the centuries from Egyptian priests yeah. to their disciples. And he turned his little chapel into the alchemical and Masonic path to illumination. And then, of course, the Illuminati, we all know, was founded in 1776. And so I think what happened was that the, the Roman Catholic Church created so much mayhem and pain and suffering throughout the world through all their massacres that they had done, that it, was, it became that the Jesuits became outlawed. And so the Roman Catholic Church needed um, some henchmen. And I believe that was when the Illuminati was born to carry out the work of the Roman Catholic Church to keep them out of the fray. Right. You, you're speaking about the Bavarian uh, Illuminati at this right. stage. Yeah. So it all started after the start of the French Revolution in 1789. They started to stage these festivals in Paris, which were basically all about selling time and savagery. And so these festivals were obviously the, the new world fairs after the fall of Tartaria. And they were really selling a psychological operation behind the facade of selling products. Yeah. You'll see in here one of the things that were for sale were this, this panoramic wallpaper, Savages of the Pacific Sea. And then in 1877 was the very first ever prehistoric art discovery in the world in Altamira, Spain. And the man who found them, he was accused of forgery. And this Emile Cartel, Cartelac gentleman was actually working the World Fairs, doing his prehistoric shows at the World Fairs. So he was considered the biggest expert out there. And he was denying them authenticity. This was a huge thing because now they would have to wait 22 more years before they even put another prehistoric piece of cave art out there into the public. And as you can see, that finding Altamira piece there is uh, part of the ongoing struggle for us to, to make us believe that these cave paintings are real. Very good. Because 140 years later, they're still trying to drum it into our heads that this prehistoric art is authentic. But here's my smoking gun picture, Sasha. I was looking through, you know, researching and everything. And then I see a picture of a prince, an artist and a Jesuit priest standing outside a little cave. So that sure did spark my interest. And we have Prince Albert of Monaco, Abbe Brule, the Jesuit priest. And in the future, he would become, to become known as the prehistoric Pope. And then you have the artist, Louis Tenere, who was the, uh, the prince's sort of artist consort and traveled with him everywhere. And then Hugo Obermeyer was the Bavarian prehistorian who was present. So it's all tying in nicely with the Illuminati. And this Cartelac gentleman, prehistorian, <laughs> obviously he started out as a true researcher. We see pictures of him with megaliths and monoliths and all of this stuff. I'm sure he was researching giants and everything else, but they really needed him in particular to authenticate their cave art. And so that's why it took so long, this, this bitter controversy that lasted 22 years. And then we'll leave them alone for a while and we'll go to the Trocadero and the Paris World Fair in 1878. And this is where you've got your, your lawnmowers and your toothpaste started. So 
You see how it goes out into the world and forever and ever and ever, we're using these products that they produced at these world fairs. And they had also recently found the first Neanderthal skull in 1864. And these colonialists were just awful. Yeah. And I'm going to quote you from Dr. Pierre Paul, Paul Broca, who founded the first anthropology institute in the world, which was housed in the Trocadero, the same place that the World Fair was. And he said, I would rather be transformed a transformed ape than a degenerate son of Adam. And he also proclaimed that Negroes are an intermediate form between apes and Europeans. So just as these world fairs were the heart of the Great Reset, the visual art they generated were the arteries that pumped the whole blood economy from the heart of the fairs out into the rest of the body politic yeah. across the world. Yeah, beautifully stated, Remar remarkable. So I call this the great belittling and great bedazzling because the fairs allowed for a place to highlight the contrast between the indigenous peoples and the technology of the fairs, which ironically was displayed from these beautiful Tartarian buildings that held way more technology yes. than any of the gizmos at the fair. And so if this doesn't drive home how powerful the visual arts are, I just, I really don't know what would. And um, here's an introduction to the artists. They're painting us in this really, you know, I mean, I just would laugh at these. It is absolutely laughable, isn't it? Okay, so you once looked like that, but the psyop behind it was, was really very dark. Yeah. So they've got these Aborigines displayed at the World Expo in 1884. And then what they give to us as early Homo sapiens they have the same look, confused, fearful. Yeah. And then at the same time, also at the World Fairs, they're selling pears soap for sale throughout the civilized world. So we see this, this issue with cleanliness and, and the synthetic form of hygiene that's starting to brew, the chemicals starting to come into fruition during right. the second industrial revolution of the 1870s. And then these, these were called human zoos. Well, that term was coined in the year 2000, but they were basically human zoos, colonial centric psychosis. And you just see how they display them as exotic creatures from the other side of the world. But meanwhile, on the other side of the world, they're incarcerating them and collecting their heads that are tattooed Maori heads. And this is around 1895 that this major general Robley was collecting these heads. And it was all very, just a very ugly situational. And then also the things that they would show about the, from the people of these human zoos, they would show their objects and their artifacts. And then they would never touch on the spiritual aspects of their lives because obviously the long game was dominion over all the earth we know now using the central banking system and 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 that connection with the world fairs and you'll see later how that the Illum the head of the illuminati we know is the pindar and the pindar is known as the ceo of the earth right well i mean so, part of that part of that mm, psyop was the diminishment of course, of all indigenous and native Aboriginal cultures and traditions, myths and legends, and the diminishment of all of those black skin, brown skin, red skin, and yellow skin peoples was integral in the agenda because they needed to, the, the hegemonial forces needed to convince the white populations of Europe uh, that, that there was a justification for going out there and civilizing the barbarians and, and thereby exploiting the resources, ransacking the coffers of Africa and Asia and Central South America so that the central bankers could formulate their economic system backed up by the collaterals of the, uh, the so-called underdeveloped world. Yes, I agree with you absolutely. And I'd even go as far as to say that BlackRock was born then 
and it's only become what it is today. So they went on this rampage of, of always showing us these prehistoric way of life that these people had and then showing us how great our lives were because they were so clean and modern and technological. And they developed these ideas of technology as, an, as a means to embrace pro progress so that we would scoff at the natural world yeah. and we would embrace how far and fast humanity was evolving. evolving. So that's why they wanted to, to make primitive life appear dirty and brutal. And then we would rush to get that vacuum cleaner, you know, available on Main Street now after it was pushed at the World Fairs. So that's how that corporatoc corporatocracy slowly built up that now today rules our world. But it's all about the timing. And as early as 1859, Charles Darwin had published his origin of the species, and it was a bestseller, of course. And then 20 years later, they found the first prehistoric cave, all lining up nicely. But then in 1871, he published The Descent of Man. And nothing says we'll never evolve and we'll never ascend than a book entitled The Descent of Man. Right. An interesting part of this is that Thomas Henry Huxley was known as Darwin's bulldog. And later on, his grandchildren would both be very active in the whole movement of this uh, psychological damage with the human race. Because Aldo Huxley would go on to write Brave New World and Julian Huxley would end up being the first director of UNESCO, United Nations Education Scientific and cultural organization, which is huge. Yeah, which is the globalists' takedown of all um, anything that, that sits outside of that uh, centralized globalist Sabatine agenda. Right. And I call it um, the Roman Empire 2.0. Yes. And don't forget, I mean, I just came back, as you know, from the Nubian desert and uh, in, in researching and looking at <clears throat> some of the pyramids out there which are bigger and twice the age and twice the size of the pyramids in Egypt. And speaking to some of the um, indigenous people out there in the Sahara Desert who live in the proximity of those Nubian pyramids, um, they were all saying that, that their access to their own um, history, their own culture has been blocked by UNESCO who have chained off all of the, uh, and, and security guarded all of these old um, tunnels and caves and pyramids. So, and they said that we all, they all know what's happening underground, but UNESCO becomes the catch all, um, sequestering all of our planetary culture and history from, from, our, from our eyes and from our sight. Yes, and they sequestered all of the caves and all of that too. But the thing is, you can register, they register it. And obviously, we know that once you've registered it with them, they own it. But one last point about this particular slide is that, that Henri Brule, the Jesuit priest, and Teilhard de Chardin went gallivanting all over the planet looking for skulls to fill the gaps in Darwin's theory, and that they found the famous Peking man. And then, of course, their findings are given to everybody, and they decide what they look like. And you can see between these two, you know, they can they can make anything they want out of it. And this whole Peking man thing became a site and it was funded by the Rockefellers. And they just they decide whatever direction they want. This this is not science. If the same Peking man can have both of those visages, you can see how they can twist and turn it to make That's you right. that you and, and ten ten thousand towns, uh, cities, towns, and villages around the world get. Uh, overnight get bursaries and grants to be able to build their little museum installations with their little cavemen and stone age men and 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 all of that stuff is, is promulgated through the midnight masons and their global network so it's a very easy software installation isn't it it is and so the roman catholic church through the work of Brule, this uh, priest was, they were so heavily invested in the psychology of prehistoric art, its effect on the masses. So they, that's when they engaged Prince Albert of Monaco. And it's really weird to me that the Spanish prince is creating these 
academic institutions of paleontology and archaeology and so on in France. But what they're doing is they're usurping those old Tartarian buildings and making them into these huge institutions, which they had started in the Renaissance, but now they could just plug it in, you know, right. to move forward. So they lend their grandeur of those Tartarian effigies. All that grandeur is lent to these fictitious enterprises. Exactly. And it gives them their whole academic standing. So then finally, now we're 20 years after the first cave discovery and suddenly Emile Cotillac finally capitulates. So that's, that's their biggest coup so far. And now because he says, okay, you know, he has, does this mea culpa and a big about face and apologizes and because obviously he was strong armed into it. It'd be fascinating to know what happened if ever there was uh, a use for remote viewing and for project looking glass it would be fascinating wouldn't it to be going back and seeing exactly what it was that uh, forced him into compliance well it was obviously his position i would imagine and it was probably the pressure from the catholic church well we know that and, oh that he also got a generous donation from prince albert too <laughs> well, there you go <laughs> there you go so then um, in the meantime, they had their archaeological wing of priests, mind you. So there's your direct connection to the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. And so they're making this all happen at the same time. This skull was found in 1908. And the, um, the cave El, El Castillo was found in 1903. So you, it's all happening around the same time. And then here's a, the proof here with Abe Brühl with his uh, Department of Fake Art Discoveries and then Father oh, Jay Boissonni oh, with his Department of Skullduggery is what I call it. But that's fantastic. And that's exactly <laughs> what it is, isn't it? <laughs> and then here's the most interesting part was this little Brühl character, the Catholic priest, um, his father was a magistrate, but you never find anything about his mother. And it's funny how they always inculcate these little lost souls into their wing, under their wings. And so when he was young, this Abbe Brule went to um, a society called the Society of Mary, which were the Marists. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Marists, but this was their answer to the fact that the Jesuits were being hounded out of town. And so they decided to create the Marists and they believed in the Virgin Mary and they would walk around all day behaving and acting like the Virgin Mary. And this was their answer. But I guess they was, were managing to regroup really as Jesuits and training Jesuits, but yet they were called Marists. So that was his upbringing. And then he was really highly influenced by this Father Jay Boissonni, where they both sat down and they would discuss the questions and origins of creation and evolution. And that brought forward all the books about their apology that maybe we weren't created from God, we came from the apes. Oh. And this whole discussion ensued and they kept going, they kept going with it. And then here's the third character from my smoking gun picture. His name was Louis Tenere. And he would go around with um, the Albert I of Monaco on all his hunting trips and record them in paint, take photographs. He'd go on all his sailing trips around the world. And uh, this is who I think was the artist who did the caves. Very good. So it's a stretch, but but as we go on, you'll see, you know, he, he was, he was yeah. really good at what he did. And his alibi, his alibi would be that, oh, he was out sailing with the Prince of Monaco. Mm -hmm. And then in 1940 rolls around and wow, another big discovery. And this is the most famous uh, prehistoric cave in the world. And here, you know, I am insisting on saying prehistoric cave here because 
There's many, many caves all over the world. They're perfectly authentic. It's just that they're not from 60,000 years ago. Right. You know, and they're usually done with a little light and yeah. they're not done all like a mile into, into the cave and things right. like this. Yeah. And you can trace back the tribe, where the tribe came from. Yeah. So this one, now, now they're a little gun shy about these cave discoveries. So they, they discover it right a year into World War II. So, you know, who the heck's going to care about a cave discovery in the middle of a world war? Just yeah. about nobody. So <clears throat> then terrible dilemma happens. The human the breath of everybody is destroying the paint of the caves. So they have to close them all, all of a sudden and get everybody out of there, evacuate the caves. And, you know, after, after think about it, they sometimes say the caves were 65,000 years old, but the most recent looks at it, they're going only back to 30,000 now. Mm -hmm. But they've been through a couple of ice ages. They've been through all of this stuff and plus there's stuff dripping down inside the caves and stalagmites and stuff it, i just don't see how this paint would ever manage to stay on the walls for thirty thousand years honestly right. right so here come the replicas they didn't just stop at one replica oh no they do four replicas one's a traveling one which reminds me of like a little mini world fair traveling around the world too mm -hmm. And they also try to take it like into the 21st century and make it all space agey and give it a whole new branding. You know, we've moved out of this age into this incredible new spacey age. Yes. And, and not only did the, the caves get bumped up with their look, their new replica spacey look, they gave all the prehistoric people this sort of new super cool i can identify with those white privileged people bejeweled and everything kind of look but where this really breaks down is the fact that they failed to consider all the other skulls you know the elongated and all of those skulls the giant skulls and so on in any of their work so we can, we can't when we absolutely don't have to buy any of this stuff because as far as I'm concerned, they could all be absolutely different species. Yeah. And also the arrogance of the pirating of where humanity came from in the first place is so megalomaniacal. And the twisting of humanity into these caricatures of God's creation kind of adds insult to injury. And then without considering the other skulls, it just becomes ridiculous in the extreme. But the, it's the subliminal visual psychology behind this that is slowly affecting humanity as we're going forward. Then, of all things, in 1956, there's another cave discovery. And obviously, again, derided as a hoax. Now, why are all these caves being derided as a hoax? Honestly, one after the other. They were spurned by explorers as bogus. And so what happened was in this particular case, there was a man, a gentleman called Mr. Martin, and you go to research him and he's just gone from history. He, he had said he's been in these caves. He was in the caves 10 years ago. He never saw any drawings in there. Ah, very good. So we have a, an eyewitness, and not only an eyewitness, we have an accomplice with him. Well, not an accomplice, but a fellow speleologist with him, backing him up in everything that he's saying. But now along comes Henri Brule, the Catholic Jesuit priest, and says, I declare the figures perfectly authentic. Oh, well. And that's the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And these are the actual caves that were discovered and as you can see they're very kind of iffy but they're they are images and another thing too the charcoal you could use charcoal or you could use manganese oxide and in many cases it was this manganese oxide 
And the only place you can find this manganese oxide is over 150 miles away in the Pyrenees Mountains. So that's another thing. Then this is where my whole theory should absolutely collapse because you, you should say, no, Jane, that's impossible because these caves were discovered in 1994. But I you know, had to sleep on that a few nights and I came up with the fact that they said that a landslide fell over this cave entrance 21,000 years ago. And I believe that they blocked it themselves and they let it sit there and age, like, like just like Michelangelo did with his forgeries. He would age them, stick them in the ground for a while. And they let it be discovered. And this would be their insurance policy against all the other ones being authentic as well. Because, oh my goodness, it's discovered so far into the future. And these happen to be the most beautiful drawings, the oldest of all the drawings, the most refined. It just goes on and on and on. And they're 30, 15,000 years earlier than the ones we've already seen. So we should be, according to Darwin's theory of evolution, we should be going forward but we're going backwards now. Yeah. They're, they're really just going all out. And even the, there was a critic that said that the exceptional quality of the art indicates a type of civilized people. So if that doesn't tell you, you know, that a civilized person did it, right. there's, more, there's more to it than that too, because also we have our, our Professor Pettit over in England, the British prehistorian. And he comes along and writes a paper called Against Chauvetnism because he said that the drawings were just simply too magnificent for their time. But over in England, this poor little guy, they only found one piece of prehistoric art in the whole country. And here in, in, in France, it's just a circus. It's just like Disneyland cave art in Paris. Yet, you know, just... In England, there's nothing there. Right. And, right. and the, the other, another thing that gives it away too is this Gilles Tosello. He said it's likely that just one artist was responsible because mm. you can tell the way a person picks up a pen and the line will get thicker and then thinner and you can see where they moved from here to here to here. And it's all been monitored. And so that is the work of possibly one artist yeah. and they go through exactly when the rhinos were drawn first and the horns and the muzzles the front legs the bellies it's a mm -hmm. very in-depth study and so i do think it was louis tenere who was running in there and creating these and then they sealed it up and they let it sit there and age the, the consort to Prince Albert I of Monaco, who obviously, remember, was the founder of the Archaeological and Paleolithic Institutes of Paris. And he was working in lockstep as in, in good stead as the Spanish conquistador that he was, friend yeah. of the Roman Catholic Church. They were all in on it. Yeah. And these are examples of like normal cave art discoveries. You know, somebody might wander in with a stone and scratch around a bit, you know, and then they'll say, wow, we've got prehistoric cave art. You just can't tell. And these dates are much, much earlier, are much closer to our time, 6,500 years ago. The, the British reindeer that they have to draw an outline of so that you can even see it, Creswell Crags, that's 13,000 years old. So that gives you an idea of what they really should look like. And then in California, Schumach, I believe they're Schumach. They have cave art that mm. you, you can trace back the tribes, the people, are, the descendants are still alive, you know, because we tend to think that, you know, all cave art is the same and it's all prehistoric yeah. by the way it's treated. 
And then when we go back and look at the three main caves, we've got Altamira in Spain, Lasso and Chauvet of France. And we just see the similarities. The most outstanding one to me is the fact that we know we're working with, with these people who love symbols and each one has their bull. Each one has their horned deity as the biggest feature in it. And then the rest are just, um, and the hand thing, I'll go into that later, those hands. But you can see the similarities of the work. It does very much look like the work of the same artist. And then you think about all the other 25 caves and you go look at them and it, they really do look like maybe this Louis Tenet ran in, did a few sketches and ran back out because the lines and the way that it's drawn is just of an accomplished artist that never made mistakes, you know, just drew it perfectly the first yeah. time. And in many of the other caves, which they use to authenticate these Disney World prehistoric caves, they have to use light boxes in front of where the drawings are to show you exactly what you're looking at so that you can even see it. So it's all very up in the air. I have all the names of these caves and when they were discovered and all of that stuff that I could bore you with, but I'm not going to, I'm going to give you an overview. So I think basically Tanea may have been too talented for the job. And, and I as I said, the caves were pre-aged. Now, the biggest thing of all that gives Tanea away is that he got the gate right every time, the animal gate. And there have been so many studies that have been done where the gate is incorrect. Even Leonardo da Vinci has been bound to get the gate of an animal wrong. Yeah. So this is what's giving him away at this point. And it was through the pioneering work of Edward Mybridge in the 1880s, who he, he did those first movies of the animals moving, depicting animal locomotion. And that was right when Mr. Louis Tenere was running around doing his art. So he it would have been absolutely brought to his attention. So now they have to do damage control in the media. So you know how you've seen those, those news broadcasts, one after the other of them saying exactly the same thing. They did the same thing with this, uh, with the caves. Now they're saying that cavemen are trumping modern artists at drawing animals. And they have all these scientific reviews about it. Caves, cavemen trump modern artists at drawing animals over and over again from every publication because now they're worried because once this gets out then it's over for them because getting the gait of an animal correct is very advanced artistry so then what would happen is to get this out there to the school curriculums and out across the world, what Henri Bruhl would do is he would go into the case and sketch over the drawings that had been done and create these books, especially with Emile Cotillac, mm -hmm. who they had swayed. And then they'd put these books out all over the world into the, the school curriculums. Very good. And then I just threw this in because I thought it was interesting. Uh, Picasso decides to go visit Chauvet. And when he came out, he said, all is decadence. And so that to me tells me he knew and he knew how what brazen liars they were. And he was probably connected to all of them as well. <laughs> That's a very interesting point. Yeah. And then he followed the art and did his own cave art, you know, updated to Picasso-esque. But now here is the real reason that I think that the caves were discovered when they were and just discovered, period. Because across the sea in southern France, a myth arose, a legend with a boat. And here come the two Marys and Mary's, your favorite guy, Mary's brother Lazarus on the boat. 
and they arrive in France. And so May, this is when Mary Magdalene brought the Gnostic teachings to France. And it's the same area, the exact same area that even today where all the pilgrims run through the south of France and into Spain, where these, where these caves are. Yeah. Which is, um, France is known as the capital of prehistory. Yeah. So, and also according to Fomenko, Christ incarnated on earth during the 1100s. So that places the influence of Mary's teachings and the Cathars much nearer to the period of today than we think it was, you know, instead of back there in ancient history. And we've already seen that the colonialists and the Roman Catholic Church had done everything they could to prevent an opposing view of their beliefs in order yeah. to keep their plans for humanity on track. So this ends up being a, like a mass ritual area and kiss, Christian killing ground because that's where they killed um, 500,000 Cathars. Uh, and so, it, so this was during the Inquisition. So what that, that particular genocide fell uh, uh, on which date exactly with the Cathars? 12, 1294, is, I believe, is when it started. And it went on right. for quite a while. I'd have to find that in my notes, the actual dates. Right, don't you? But this, the most important part of this, Sasha, is that they discovered the Gospel of Mary in 1897. But it was only us little peons only found out about it in 1983, like almost 100 years later. But you could be very sure that the Roman Catholic Church knew about it. Mm -hmm. And that's when they went into high gear to drive this prehistoric cave on home. Yeah. And um, here's the cave, the Lombries cave, where these Cathars ran to hide. And it, they hid in the bottom of the cave and they stayed there until they died rather than be um, burnt at the stake and tortured by the Roman Catholic Church. What a story. And here's, Fomenko putting birth of Christ at 1054 during a supernova explosion, because remember he was proving everything by way of astronomical alignments. Yeah. So we have every reason to believe him. And then I just want to say a little bit about the Gospel of Mary because it's a non canonical text. And it was a fifth century papyrus codex written in Sahidic Coptic. And mm. it was not relating to part of or sanctioned by anything from the Catholic Church because her teachings went completely against the teachings of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. And she was teaching a highly advanced spiritual message, even beyond the comprehension of the apostles. She was known as the apostle to the apostles. Right. And this is where she continued teaching. So these the Roman Catholic Church, as we know, was only in name only were they Christian. And they and they co-opted a lot of the Cathar rites and rituals and probably celibacy and all of that. But this was a very interesting part of the journey to find the caves, because Mary Magdalene was spent, was said to have spent the last days of her life in a cave. And they say that it was at uh, St. Maxine La Saint Baume, which are those cliffs on the left-hand side. And they say that her skull encased in this gaudy golden thing that's got the Roman Catholic fingerprints all over it is in this church, the Basilica of St. Maxine La Saint Baume. And I can think of nothing funnier than the obviously the catholic church sending people go over there there's there's mary magdalene but meanwhile they know where she is and i think i know where she is i think she ended up in this abri de la madeleine which is translates to the magdalene shelter because yeah. obviously after all those um terrible slaughters and burnings and all of that stuff she would have run away and hid she wouldn't be in this grand cathedral. It, it looks very masculine too, this huge high cliff. 
But there's more to it than that. So this is where they found the skeleton of what they were calling Magdalenian girl. No, Magdalene, it was a boy. Mm -hmm. At first they said it was a male skeleton and then years go by and then they say, oh, it's a girl. And then they look again and they see, oh no, it's a woman. And so this takes years and years and years. And they, the handkerchief site is where they found the, this skeleton, which I believe is Mary Magdalene. Right. And the reason they called it the handkerchief site, I remember I, in, in Othello, the handkerchief signifies the infidelity of the wife. Right. And then when they displayed it at the Henry Field Museum, they didn't display the skeleton in this fetal position. They had it laid out on her back, you know, which has connotations too. And then one other reason I think this is Mary Magdalene is because there was a horse frieze sculpted above where she was buried. And the horse in biblical connotations is connected to resurrection. So that was a very strong piece of symbology that led me to that conclusion. And here's the Mary Magdalene skeleton shown laying on her back at the Henry Field Museum. It was shipped to America in 1916, and it was sent to the American Museum of Natural History in New York first. And then this Henry Field got his hands on it, and apparently tens of thousands of people went to see it. Oh, remarkable. So we know that the Roman Catholic Church has always painted Mary Magdalene as a whore. The whore of Babylon, that's right. And they had all these Magdalene asylums across the world for wayward women. Wow. And when they went into these asylums, they, of course, they found buried bodies and skeletons and all kinds of things in the basement. Wow. So there's this whole connection with their, their absolute hatred of Mary Magdalene and her, her true spiritual power. Yeah. And then, of course, the effigy of the false Madonna as a as a vagina, which is also a kind of kind of trickery and inversion of Kundalini. But the cherry on the top for me was when they took that skull mm. and cleaned it up and made a face from it to get the face of what I'm calling Mary Magdalene, and then they stick it in a display in less so. In other words, they bombed Mary Magdalene right back to the Stone Age. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That was what made me really think it was. Very good. And, Very good. and we also know that the Catholic Church is famous for its skull worship. Remember the Geronimo skull and the... Well, that, that famously is, is used for the... Um... You, the, the adepts of the Skull and Bones um, Club in, in Yale. Right. Bushes and the rest of them um, have to ejaculate over Geronimo's skull in a coffin while scorning and laughing at, um, at, at life. Essentially, it's anti-life. It's an anti-ritual. Exactly. Ritual. And the Geronimo's skull is a central effigy in that. And I think they have Mary's skull and they probably have done the same thing with their skull fetish syndrome, which is persistent and repetitive use of dependence on non-living objects because they're all about death. Yeah, and uh, that would let us deftly into the SS um, of the Nazis wearing skull and bones as the emblem on their uniforms it was in broad daylight they certainly planned to march that all around the surface of the earth didn't they before they were stopped and then there's i, I was going to tell you about these hands that are so suspicious this odd hand phenomenon there just seems to be way too many hands painted everywhere and in this one article they couldn't the la times did this article they couldn't resist doing you know the devil background with the hands yeah. which tells me they know there's a lot more going on behind the scenes 
And these hands are also in our Argentina caves and the Cosca cave in Marseille in France and the Gargas caves. They're everywhere and there's something up about them. And I think it's to do with rituals. And you know how these people love these dark, dank, underground places. Yeah. So, you know, just put two and two together. And the odd thing is there's a couple of caves where this finger amputation occurs so that, that the after they've blown the paint over the hand, there's maybe one or two fingers and not all of the fingers. So yeah. this is just some kind of torture. And then they, they just- or, or, in, or initiation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's something very eerie and you know, we've got these people going in their thousands and millions every day through all of these replica caves, believing that they came from prehistory and yeah. seeing these broken fingers and all of this, it, it's a ritual. It's a harvesting ritual, just dragging everything they can from the plasma around them. Yeah. And it meant so much to them that in 1944, they sent a Nazi plane during the middle of the war over a Monsigur, which was a Cathar castle, carrying Alfred Rosenberg, and they flew a, sw a swastika pattern over it. Mm. that's how much it meant to them you know this whole area and the cathars and the religion just after this mass sacrifice of over 500,000 of them were burned and tortured and slaughtered mm -hmm. they were probably bringing that back that that the essence of that ritual mm. and it's very interesting interesting to look at uh, the difference between the word Catholic and Cathar, because Cathar is related to catharsis, which is any extreme change in emotion that results in renewal, restoration, revitalization, and it releases the hidden creative forces. So that, you know, that would be the last thing that the Roman Catholic Church would ever want. And then Catholic is a synonym for the word universal or everything rolled into one, and that, in other words, is globalism. The most interesting thing about the word Christian is that it comes from cretin, and the word cretin is derived from vulgar Latin, Christianus, and that word only came into being during the 17th century. So before that time, there wasn't even one single Christian on the, on the earth. And when I look at that word Christian too, I see at the end the, the T-I-A-N. You bring it to the other end, you get anti-Chris. So this is what I'm seeing in the word Christian now. And I don't know that I'll ever use that word again because it's just uh, obsolete. It, it means cretin. And another thing that correlates with all of this Cathar business and their spirituality and Mary Magdalene being there is the fact that they were very organic and the, the, the Roman Catholic Church was dreaming up this huge synthetic realm that it wanted to create that would end up poisoning everything, the factories that would be coming all of the pollution that would be coming. And they would always paint the cave life as so brutal and barbaric because they didn't want us to think for even a second that we there was a paradise upon the earth where we roamed and walked freely with the animals, possibly vegetarians. We didn't run around hitting animals over the head to feed and clothe ourselves. You know, that's the only scenario we've been taught. We just, we don't know that. And there's a very interesting thing about this Rex Deus and the Rex Mundi, because the Rex Deus made the heavens and the human soul, while the evil God Rex Mundi entrapped that soul to suffer in the flesh of the human body on earth. And here we have in the world heritage symbol, it says, Patrimonio mundial. Mm. It's right in that symbol. And which, 
also means ownership of the commons. So the yeah. teachings of Mary Magdalene were absolutely in direct opposition also to this new code in 1917, which came along that all the popes were dreaming up to make usury legal. So through the Roman Catholic Church, it was um, Pope Pius X. Yes. And they, they made it legal for the church to get usury, which lined up with the world fairs, the new materialist world, the industrial revolution. Well, and, and the priest banker class that became the parent corporation, that became the satanic thrall that we're living in today. And going back a little bit to what you were saying about the industrial uh, industrialization of our world, industrial um, um, revolution and so on, and, and uh, was, was all about the stealth intervention of synthetic molecules coming in again to every product, every aspect of our lives, um, because that's how the devil has crept into the human genome is through um, nano stealth through synthetic molecules being peppered into every aspect of our lives over the last 100 and 200 years. Yes, and that would be the micro level on which they've invaded us. And then the UNESCO and World Heritage is the macro level in which they've invaded the rest of the world. Yeah, weaponizing academia and, um, and entertainment and, uh, and media, yeah. And um, the symbology is absolutely rife everywhere you look around these caves, the bull first, you know, the horned deity. Yeah. And even in the Chauvet caves, they painted an owl, you know, they couldn't help themselves. Those hands again, and they found them also near the archway, this huge pont du arc, very yeah. near the Chauvet caves and the Esti El Castillo caves. There was a pyramid right where the caves were discovered. So you've got this symbology just reeking out nonstop from everything. And then here is the manipulated visual trajectory of human evolution from prehistoric to transhumanic, which I think is so laughable, like at this time trickery trajectory, where on the one end, you've got half a brain of a, of a prehistoric ignoramus. And on the other end, you've got looks like the brain almost removed and replaced with technology. And you've got the old cave behind the, the Neanderthal, and then you've got the new hyped up techno cave behind the transhumanist being. And then in the background, you, they always have some sneaky little man who's working for them. In this case, the prehistoric oh. end, it was Brule. And on the other end today, it's uh, your favorite and my favorite guy. Anal Swab. Schwab. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just an overview mm -hmm. going into the main themes that affected this prehistoric cave art. Obviously, the, the Gospels of St. Mary, Cartillac being won over after 20 yeah. years. Yeah. And then this is a graphic of the circle of the death cult, starting with the phylum reptilia alchemy of destruction. Yeah. With the caves moving around to obviously first world fairs, then the, the rubber barons coming in, the banking system, chemicals, chemical plants, pollution, sl child slave labor, the pollution and degradation of the earth, the AI and all of that stuff. And then down in the bottom left-hand corner, you see that pink area. It's like they've taken over everything and we have to get it back. And it's a huge task and we need to be working day and night and night and day until we've got it back again, because it's being taken away right under our noses by the minute at this point. And that central piece there, you know, really look at the size of that piece of equipment that's just gouging into the earth. It's just beyond the beyond the beyond. Yeah, and something out of Lord of the Rings, isn't it? So they pulled off their great hat trick with the Darwinism, the cave discoveries, the usury code, the human zoos, and the rubber barons, especially with the codification of usury.
especially. But then mm. the kicker to me was they throw in the social Darwinism, which then allows for this laissez-faire capitalism, which is the triumph of market forces over morality. Yes, very good, very good. And then the second timeline of the prehistoric psychopathogenesis genesis of man is when they have the First World War and the Second World War, just extensions of these Roman Crusades. And then once the Second World War is over, the UN is founded in 1945. And that's when you get the offshoot of UNESCO and you've got the Roman Empire 2.0 and it keeps continuing and continuing. We had a World Fair in 2017 in Astana, in Kazakhstan. It just and the Satanic that, Central as well. And this that, that's that super Illuminati symbolized city. Have you seen it? Astana. Yeah, yeah, of course. I've been studying it for um, over 15 years now, yeah, in Kazakhstan. And that was all about the future of energy, but at the, in that same year they find the world's oldest known figurative artwork in Indonesia, which is this warty pig. Just to remind us, we still came from apes and there's the pig and then there's the hand right in the same area. Same old, same old, yeah. And then here is a discovery I made about the logos of the UNESCO World Heritage logo if you take their conventions for the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage logo it fits right over the world heritage logo except for a little triangle in the middle is the only difference Very and it, it's a combination of the boy love and that's when i began to think that the children and the adult next to these adult hands in these um caves mm were suspect because the, especially the caves in Argentina, because that's the, almost the highest child trafficking place in the world after Taiwan. And curiously enough, the existing Pope Jorge was very much in, in, implied um, within the Argentinian junta back in the 1970s, correct, connected to all of this uh, shenanigans. So basically they have their hand in everything. And again, the, the, the logos and the symbols, there's under UNESCO comes man and the biosphere program. And that clearly has the Ankh in it, which is the key of life. And it's synonymous with Isis, who's worshiped by the Greco-Roman world. And, and is, Isis was the first daughter of Geb and Nut, who are the god of the earth and the goddess of the sky. So you see this constant symbology of trying to take over the whole entire world and the man and the biosphere program MAB is also an acronym for the monoclonal an antibody which I feel is connected to the chemtrails and everything is spraying into the air and then of course you remember in the renaissance they took the renaissance and they told us that Raphael really died of uh, upper respiratory connected to covid symptoms uh -huh. and, and, and not the syphilis we were led to believe and then with the prehistoric art age this huge age now they bring that forward into the local media to back it up and, and talk about um, moments from modern history being reimagined as ancient cave art, which yeah. includes COVID-19 and Brexit and Black Lives Matter. So yeah. throw that all in the cave thing, because these, these art movements are so huge and they've been so emblazoned into our minds yeah. through our indoctrination that as soon as it's backed up by something like that, we give it credence. Yeah. And then this is my little slide about um, Pindar being the CEO of the earth and all the connections between the Pindar, the white, gray, black Pope, and then the little pimps, which would be like Chardin and Brule. And the interesting thing is we have hope because the last Pindar was Benjamin de Rothschild, but he died on January the 15th, 2021 at age 57. So right. I, just remembering that Pindar 
Penda means penis of the dragon. Right. The of the dragon. We're talking about the white imperial Draco reptilian lizard class of non-human, the Draco reptilians, which essentially are the acme of the um, alien interventionism into the angelic humans over millennia. So my conclusions after this were that everything synthetic is satanic. And then after the caves were discovered, they were perpetuated ad nauseum as entertainment. They made of us absolute caricatures with the Flintstones. So we were as far from any notion of an ascended being as possible. They made of humanity a perpetual cartoon character of yeah. itself. Very good. But the following of Mary Magdalene and the divine feminine is more organic and Gnostic. And the Cathars were the ascension keepers. Yeah, and you can throw the Essenes in with them as well. Exactly, yep. And um, on the other side of the equation, you can attribute all of the evils and the witchery in the church and the religious um, um, mind issuing from the Pharisees. And then here is all the symbolism connected to the caves that's constantly placed in front of us because we just have to um, grow our awareness of like every visual we lay our eyes upon, you know, because this is the power of art and the power of symbolism. Symbolism is art. Yeah. It's an international form of communication. And it bypasses all the barriers of language, race, culture, and it speaks directly to each level of the human psyche, but most meaningfully to the collective unconsciousness. So it's time to really jack up our awareness of what we're looking at, what we're seeing, and start creating our own language and our own symbology that would push us forward in a positive way for our true evolution that these people have hijacked from us. And then like two days ago, I found this cover of this book, Yuval Noah Harari. And what is on the cover of that book? A human painting, a prehistoric bull in a cave. And the name, Pocahontas. the name of the book is The Birth of Humankind. So they, they know the power of it and they're still at it and they're still trying to drum that home into us. So my answer to that is my painting, which is unfinished, sadly, but it's about the slaying Archangel Michael, slaying the false light flame, banishing it into the sharp, sharp rocks of the ocean below forever. <laughs> Very good. So I will stop my screen share now. And Very good. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you. There's a couple of uh, slides there that were of, of particular interest uh, to me, and I'm going to um, yeah go back and revisit them. Um, it, it helps tremendously to con contextualize um, the, the cacophony, the cacophony of the status quo, and how it's um, how it has emerged. I mean, it's it's such an interesting thing because on the one hand, you know, we're speaking to the fact that all of the empirical um, educative materials and academic um, um, pathology of learning um, about Neanderthals and Stone Age, this, that, and the other, and old bits of pottery and all the shite that's issued from the Vatican um, Library and the British Museum and the Smithsonian and how they've infiltrated all of academia, which then, of course, infests the the narrative of media, which becomes also typified into entertainment. So the whole thing becomes the self-fulfilling um, galactic wheel of deception and bullshit and hyperbole. And, and the net net result is, is 7 billion fucked up human beings staggering around, scratching our heads going, <laughs> who the fuck are we? Where do we come from? Where are we headed? And it's beautiful because actually, you know, those alien skulls, you showed some plates earlier. I mean, I personally handled a couple of these over the years, the, the crystal skull, 
um, with the, the Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull, something I'm still variously engaging with through its wonderful keeper, friend of mine, Bill Homan, and uh, Lloyd Pye and the, and the Star uh, Child Skull, that remarkable skull he brought to my home many years ago. I had a, um, a salon evening in my home in London, had many great and good people turn up to hear Lloyd Pye speak, and, and uh, we handled that extraordinary Star Child Skull, which is an alien skull for sure. And, um, you know, you were showing images earlier of a whole panoply of these extraterrestrial skulls bona fide and it's not like there's just three or four of them there are thousands and thousands and thousands of them all around the world but they're never ushered into the portals of academia they're never exemplified in the lecture halls of the royal uh, society and the geographical society and the so on and so on so it's it's these these motherfuckers who the Midnight Masons who stole their way in and essentially for the last, certainly the last couple of hundred years have maintained a steel curtain between what we see, what we learn, what we hear about and what we don't. But yeah, by the grace of God and the emergence of the great revelation, which is upon us, um, the scales fall from the eyes. We begin to see um, so much more keenly through this glass darkly well jane my darling i know this is um, going to lead to more um, inquiry and exploration of the subject matter and i think that um, i'd like to talk to you about actually doing a proper film make a proper film about this stuff but thank you we're 20 minutes over time but time well spent and i'm delighted that this segment is as long as it is thank you for joining us today on lazarus thank you so much sasha i really enjoyed sharing my information Thank you.